So hello everybody and welcome to this uh, brand new uh, Cerebral Blood Flow virtual uh, seminar. It's a special one um, this week. Uh, it will be more point counterpoint and overall discussion about uh, cerebrovascular reactivity. Uh, let's, uh, I'm Patrice Brassard from uh, Université Laval in Quebec City. I'm co-hosting with uh, Dr. Caroline Records uh, from Texas. Uh, she couldn't be uh, around uh, for so today, so I'm taking care of the presentation. Um, even if we all know the rules um, uh, of engagements, let's uh, review it one more time because we have one specific uh, detail or different detail uh, this week. So um, you can um, keep your microphone on mute and video off throughout the, the session, please. Uh, in terms of questions, even uh, if you have like specific clarification uh, about uh, one of the specific talk, uh, you could eventually include it in the question in the chat or raise your hand. But for the more general discussion, general questions, it will be uh, at the end of the three uh, talks from Dr. Olin, uh, Lucas and uh, Mullinger. Um, the session again will be recorded and posted on the Carnet uh, website uh, within the week. Um, and if you are interested in uh, contributing to this network, you can definitely share, uh, have a, uh, send an email to Docker Records uh, and, and, and send a, an e, a CV. And there is no uh, membership fee for the moment. So without uh, any further ado, um, the overall uh, topic of, uh, of uh, today will be cerebral vascular reactivity. What are we measuring? And the main the speakers will be Dr. Ryan Olin, uh, who is a postdoc uh, fellow at the Vancouver General Hospital and uh, University of British Columbia. And we'll, we'll also have uh, Dr. Sam Lucas and uh, Karen Mullinger from the, from the University of Birmingham. So again, uh, it, 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 without any further ado, let's uh, start uh, with Dr. Olin. Sorry, here we go. Awesome, thank you for, for having me today and the opportunity to speak. So when we're thinking about CO2 reactivity, um, we think, have to think about how we're delivering carbon dioxide and then how we're measuring the response. And so today I'm gonna focus on stimulus delivery for CO2 reactivity testing, or in other words, um, how exactly are we increasing end tidal or arterial CO2 gradients to then measure the consequence real blood flow response. So when you think about CO2 reactivity, um, I would define this as the unit change in steroid blood flow per unit change in carbon dioxide. And if we're to graphically represent this, uh, we have steroid blood flow on the y-axis here, arterial carbon dioxide on the x-axis, and then a, a baseline where uh, it's eubnic breathing, which usually represents an end tidal arterial carbon dioxide of around 40. And we know that when carbon dioxide increases, so does steroid blood flow. And when carbon dioxide decreases, Steroid blood flow will follow in suit. And if we kind of arbitrarily denote this as normal reactivity, which we would define as the slope of the linear regression between carbon dioxide and steroid blood flow, um, we would observe low reactivity as a, a lessening of the slope and high reactivity as a steepening of the slope. And then we're able to quantify reactivity kind of in two general ways, one being absolute changes in blood flow or the, the milliliter per minute change or centimeter per second change um, in blood flow per unit change in entelic carbon dioxide or the relative um, flow change, which would just be the percent change in blood flow per unit change in entitled carbon dioxide. Now, when we're thinking about CO2 reactivity, another thing that is important for us to consider is that uh, the vasomotor responsiveness of carbon dioxide occurs effectively throughout the entire cerebrovascular tree. We'll have changes in arterial caliber at the capillary level, at the pele vessels, in the large intracranial arteries branching from the uh, circle of willis, such as the middle cerebral artery, and then also the large extracranial cerebral conduit vessels, um, such as the internal carotid artery, uh, will also dilate during hypercapnia. And this won't play into the delivery of CO2 too much, but it's important for us to consider when we're selecting our measurement techniques, as well as this will impact, impact them. So why might we measure CO2 reactivity? Well, I'm sure every lab here has their own, own reason. Um, we certainly have ours, but I think there's a few general things that probably speaks to all of us. Um, a couple of examples being 
CO2 reactivity has been demonstrated to be linked to cardiovascular mortality, and this was shown in the Rotterdam study. And it's also been uh, linked to dementia as well. And so we know that to some extent, CO2 reactivity is giving us an indication of serial blood vessel health and function. And this, this can be important in our research if we're looking at um, tracking changes in, in uh, serial blood vessel health with pathology, looking at potential decreases in reactivity, or looking at increases in reactivity with interventions such as exercise, for example. But before we start um, conducting CO2 reactivity tests, and what I want to focus this on is there's some questions we have to ask ourselves about the method that we're going to use to manipulate carbon dioxide levels. And these considerations kind of generally fall under, um, you know, how might the method be appropriate for the research question? And then do nuances of the specific method we choose have potential impacts on the way we interpret data? Now, um, I'm gonna talk about this today, but if you wish to go and learn more about this, I would refer you to several experts um, in the field my PhD supervisor, Professor Phil Ainsley, and then Professor, uh, Professors Joe Fisher and James Duffin from the University of Toronto. And, and these three individuals have definitely published a lot of work uh, on this topic that has been very valuable for my own learning. So I'd recommend that you um, seek those works out as well. Now, if we're relative to these considerations, um, I'm going to focus on three physiologic and technical factors that that are really important, I believe, when we're selecting the CO2 reactivity tests that we're going to utilize. First, are you able to achieve a physiologic steady state? Um, and you know, this is important if you want to achieve physiologic steady state, not necessarily all experimental paradigms will seek to do this. What is the expected end title to arterial CO2 gradient that we're going to get when we use a specific method? Um, Typically, we'll use end tidal carbon dioxide as a surrogate for arterial carbon dioxide because of the ease of use, um, and it, it eliminates the need to uh, invasively uh, acquire blood samples. But we know that arterial carbon dioxide is really the stimulus that we're trying to index. So the agreement between these two variables can be very important. And then finally, how might ventilatory chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide impact our method of CO2 delivery for a cerebrovascular reactivity test? In other words, would breathing more or less in response to the change in CO2 impact our ability to deliver a specific CO2 stimulus? Now, there's lots of ways uh, to assess cerebrovascular reactivity. Some labs will use acetazolamide infusion. We won't talk about that today. We'll just focus on carbon dioxide. And under the umbrella of carbon dioxide delivery, we have manual methods such as breath holding, fixed changes in the fraction of inspired CO2 or FiCO2. Uh, rebreathing, and then computerized methods such as dynamic and tidal forcing and prospective and tidal targeting. Now, for today's talk, I'm just going to focus on fixed changes in FiCO2 and dynamic and tidal forcing, and then provide some uh, an example study of where I think these considerations come into play and can impact um, the, the data interpretation. So looking at uh, dynamic and tidal forcing here, I have a, a schematic outlining it. Um, and, and the system I'm going to talk about specifically was one developed by Dr. Glenn Foster at UBC Okanagan. And what this entails is measuring end tidal gases and uh, respiratory flow parameters, which are then sent to a data acquisition board that interfaces uh, with a LabVIEW program. This program takes in the data, runs it through an error reduction algorithm, and through, because of that, then is able to independently control the amount of carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen that are delivered through a control box, uh, which I have depicted here. And so we've got our gas lines in, three computer controlled solenoid valves, and then our gas lines out. And through this, we control the amount of gas, um, the volume of gas, sorry, and the concentration of each of these gases on a breath by breath basis, which is delivered to an inspiratory bag, um, and then breathed in subsequently by the research participant. And so this allows us to change the concentration of carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen each breath to achieve our targeted end tidal gas concentration. Looking at um, how this plays out experimentally, I have uh, some data plotted for end tidal carbon dioxide on the y-axis here, um, and then time on the x-axis. And this is breath-by-breath -breath data um, for what I would just term a, a single step test or a single increase in end tidal carbon dioxide. And in this particular test, we were aiming to increase carbon dioxide by nine millimeters of mercury from baseline. 
Now, if I dress this up a little bit to, to look at the data a little bit further, um, here we have our baseline at 40 millimeters of mercury denoted by the solid line. And then these dashed lines here, horizontal dashed lines, represent plus or minus one millimeter of mercury from our target value. And we've typically defined steady state as anywhere within plus or minus one uh, millimeter of mercury of your target value. We then see when we begin to deliver um, carbon dioxide, we, can in we increase carbon dioxide here to our target value in, in five or six breaths. Uh, there's a bit of an overshoot, which then denoted by the green here, achieves steady state approximately one minute after the initiation of the CO2 stimulus. Now we can also use this to conduct multiple step increases, which I have depicted here. And if we add the same details, we can again see that each transition period is approximately one minute in duration with four minute um, steady state intervals in between. And so we're able to increase to our target value and hold it steady. And, and that this transition to our target value takes around 60 seconds. This is of course going to be variable depending on who's operating the system as it, it can take a bit of skill um, to do so. Looking at the resulting um, end tidal to arterial CO2 gradients and how well um, end tidal CO2 reflects arterial carbon dioxide as a surrogate measure. Um, I have graphed here on the y-axis, the end tidal and arterial uh, CO2 in millimeters of mercury. And then we've got three independent stages, a baseline stage, stage at plus four millimeters of mercury above baseline and plus eight millimeters of mercury above baseline. And this is uh, data that was reported in a study by Dr. Mike Timko and colleagues in 2016, and I've just graphed it for the purposes of this talk. And what we have at each stage is the end tidal CO2, the arterial CO2, and then the resulting gradient. And now the great, the axis, sorry, for the gradient is on the, the right y-axis here, and we can see it's a bit um, smaller. And what we see is that at each increasing level of end tidal CO2, um, there's a slight change in the gradient but it stays within plus or minus one millimeter of mercury. Looking further at the agreement between these measures, if we uh, conduct the blonde almond plot, and again, this is from the same study by uh, Dr. Timko, we have the average of arterial carbon dioxide and entail carbon dioxide on the x-axis here and the difference between them on the y-axis. And we can see that there's a relatively small mean bias where arterial carbon dioxide is around on average 0.3 millimeters of mercury lower than end tidal, and then limits of agreement that are about plus or minus two millimeters of mercury um, from the, the uh, mean bias. So thinking back to the technical considerations I raised at the beginning of the talk, uh, first, can you achieve a physiologic steady state? Um, you're able to relatively quickly achieve steady state within approximately 60 seconds. Uh, what is the expected end tidal to arterial CO2 gradient? Um, these gradients are relatively small, around less than uh, two millimeters of mercury and fairly consistent across a CO2 reactivity test. And then we think about how ventilatory chemosensitivity might impact the CO2 test. We know that because we're able to change the inspired gas concentration on a breath by breath basis, we're able to target end tidal carbon dioxide levels independent of ventilation. Looking at uh, changes in uh, fixed changes in the fraction of inspired CO2, here I have an experimental schematic. And basically what it entails is inspiring from a reservoir bag, or a reservoir, pardon me, usually just a Douglas bag containing a fixed percentage of carbon dioxide. And then we, of course, um, you know, measure the gas as we would. Again, I've plotted um, some, some data from these tests. Here I have end tidal carbon dioxide on the y-axis and time on the x-axis again. And we can see that once um, the participant's been switched on to the bag containing carbon dioxide, that there's a, a relatively sharp increase in entail carbon dioxide here. And I've also plotted this for another subject just to show um, the level of repeatability that you can acquire with this, this measure. Now, if we add the, uh, um, if we dress this up the same as we did the entitled carbon dioxide, uh, the entail forcing graphs, pardon me, we can again see that we're relatively steady at baseline, but this transition period to reach the end change in carbon dioxide is a little bit protracted. But following attainment of the target value, uh, it's relatively steady thereafter. And this is similar between both um, participants, albeit the time uh, to reach that value was slightly different. Now, an important consideration um, for this, for the stimulus magnitude, is the impact 
of ventilation on the resulting end tidal carbon dioxide. And so we know um, from, the end, from the alveolar gas equation that the fraction of end tidal carbon dioxide will equal the fraction of inspired carbon dioxide plus the quotient of uh, VCO2 divided by alveolar ventilation. Since FiCO2 and VCO2 are going to be stable during a, a test, that means that changes in the fraction of entile CO2 are, uh, are going to be related to the alveolar ventilation, where an individual that has a greater ventilatory response will have a lower resulting entitled carbon dioxide, and an individual with a, a lower ventilatory response will then have a higher entitled carbon dioxide. Now, with that said, it's important to point out that in these two images, the increase in carbon dioxide was 12 millimeters of mercury for both subjects. Um, so again, it, it, it can be repeatable. But what I will show some data from other labs where they found um, it to be less um, repeatable and a bit more variable. And I'm not sure why um, these differences necessarily exist, but I feel they're important to show here. And so this is data from a study published by Joe Fisher's group in 2010. And just to orient you to the graph, we have changes in end tidal carbon dioxide on the y-axis for three separate CO2 tests. One they called the low level, medium level, and high level. And this targeted a five millimeter mercury increase, a seven and a half millimeter mercury increase, and a 10 millimeter mercury increase. And the black bar is at the top of each graph to note when the individuals are doing the CO2 inhalation. And they plotted breath by breath changes in end tidal carbon dioxide for um, an FiCO2 test, and then tests using their Respirac system, which is a prospective um, end tidal targeting system. And we can see that they demonstrated a bit more variability in their um, breath by breath and tidal carbon dioxide levels. Now, the differences between the variability demonstrated in, in, in these graphs on the left versus these on the right, um, I'm not too sure, but feel it's important to, to depict here. Looking at the end tidal to arterial gas gradients that we get, we have end tidal carbon dioxide again on the y axis. And in the same format, we've got our three stages from baseline to 4% CO2 inhalation and then 8% CO2 inhalation. But what we observe here is that the gradient magnitude increases as FiCO2 increases from around 2.5 millimeters of mercury to five. And this is reported in a study by Peebles and colleagues um, from 2007 in the Journal of Physiology. Data from the same study looking at the agreement between these measures um, shows that there's a, a mean bias of around uh, two millimeters of mercury and limits of agreement around four to five uh, millimeters of mercury. So looking back at the technical considerations I raised at the beginning of the talk, are you able to achieve a physiologic steady state? Uh, yes, you can achieve a steady state. Uh, the, the time to get there might vary a bit between participants. What are the expected end tidal to arterial CO2 gradients? Well, these gradients um, are around two to five millimeters of mercury in magnitude and expected to increase with increases in FiCO2. And then finally, how might ventilatory chemosensitivity impact the test? Well, as we know, end tidal CO2 is dependent on uh, ventilation and therefore chemosensitivity will influence the magnitude of the stimulus where individuals that have a larger ventilatory response will have a lower CO2 stimulus and vice versa for individuals with a lower uh, ventilatory response. So now I want to talk about how um, these considerations may play in to how we would select a specific test to address a specific research question. And the research question that I want to um, look at today is, does ventilation per se influence cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2? And this is something that we recently um, addressed in, in Professor Fillingsy's lab. Now, why might we expect ventilation to impact CO2 reactivity? Well, this is a little bit of a background. There's a study published in 1985 by Judith Neubauer, which demonstrated that in anesthetized cats, hyperpnea led to increases in ventral medullary blood flow. And the, the interpretation of this data was that increases in ventilation would lead to increases in activation of respiratory centers, which would elicit a greater metabolic demand and then lead to an increase in blood flow due to that metabolic demand. So the question then is, if an individual is breathing more in response to CO2, are they having their CO2 mediated blood flow response and an additional metabolic, metabolically driven blood flow response, and may that impact the overall serial blood flow um, and reactivity measures that we're making. 
So this question was recently addressed in a series of studies. Uh, first study conducted by Professor Ogo in 2019 using the FICO2 or Douglas bag technique. We then followed this up in, in February 2020 with entitled forcing. And this led to uh, the publishing of a viewpoint by doctors uh, Samora and Vienna in the, the following March. So as, as, as we'll recall, um, there's slight differences between the abilities to achieve steady state, the end tidal arterial CO2 gradients, and then the relationship between ventilation and the stimulus magnitude. Now, important for the data I'll go through is really this third point about whether or not we can control end tidal carbon dioxide independent of ventilation. Because if we're looking at experimentally assessing the impact of ventilation, we would need to isolate this variable um, to, to infer any cause and effect. And if both uh, ventilation and end tidal carbon dioxide are changing at the same time, it's difficult to disentangle the influence of these two variables. So in our study, uh, we conducted three separate reactivity trials, which I've got depicted here. Um, we've got ventilation on the y-axis and end tidal carbon dioxide on the x-axis. And what we did is conducted uh, what we termed a normal ventilation CO2 reactivity test, which is in the red uh, circles here. And this is just simply, we invited participants into the lab. Uh, we conducted staged increases in entitled carbon dioxide with the forcing system, entitled forcing system, and asked participants to breathe however felt natural. Now, following this, we conducted a hyperventilation trial and a hypoventilation trial in a counterbalanced fashion, where in the hyperventilation trial, which is uh, depicted in, in the green triangles here, participants breathe. Uh, with the ventilation that was 30% greater than that in the normal ventilation trial for each stage. And then for hypoventilation, they breathe at a ventilation of 30% less than the normal ventilation trial. Now, apart from the baseline period where the hypoventilation CO2 levels is a, a bit higher because of the reduction in alveolar ventilation, we had uh, matched end tidal carbon dioxide at each stage despite the differences in, in uh, ventilation. Now, I just want to quickly compare and contrast this with um, the, the data derived using the FICO2 technique published by uh, Ogo in 2019. And here we have uh, ventilation on the y-axis, and then we've got the hypoventilation, normal ventilation, and hyperventilation trial. They conducted, conducted graded increases in carbon dioxide using 2% and 3.5% CO2 inhalation, and increases in CO2 are denoted by moving up upwards from the filled circle, open circle, uh, to the triangle symbol. We can see that ventilation increased in each trial, and that ventilation was higher in the, the normal ventilation than it was in the hypo, and again, a bit higher in the hyperventilation trial as well. So they achieved the, the differences in ventilation that they wanted. But what's most important here is to look at the end tidal carbon dioxide, where we can see that again, for the zero, two, and 3.5%, that end tidal carbon dioxide differed between the trials where end tidal carbon dioxide was higher in the hypoventilation trial than it was in the normal, and then it was lower in the hyperventilation trial than it was in the normal ventilation trial. And so this meant that changes in ventilation and end tidal CO2 were occurring um, concurrently. Now, looking at the blood flow responses that we uh, measured in our study, I have internal carotid artery blood flow on the y-axis here. And then we have the normal hypo and hyperventilation data um, presented for each end tidal carbon dioxide level. And we can see that these values overlapped quite clearly and there wasn't any appreciable difference between them. And this is the same uh, when we look at vertebral artery blood flow. So for both measurements, blood flow increased with increases in carbon dioxide, but it didn't appear to be different between trials. Now to look at cerebrovascular reactivity specifically, um, we looked at the uh, flow uh, the slope, pardon me, between blood flow and end tidal CO2, or the milliliter per minute increase here in, end in uh, internal carotid artery blood flow versus the millimeter mercury change in end tidal carbon dioxide. And we can see that there is no difference between the normal hypo and hyperventilation trial. And this is the same for the vertebral artery flow reactivity measurements as well. So from that, we concluded um, with our study that ventilation did not impact cerebrovascular reactivity. So to, to bring this all back and, and to wrap up, um, uh, there's considerations that I think are important when we're selecting our method of CO2 delivery. We need to consider its appropriateness for the research question and how the specific method may or may not impact uh, data interpretation. And, and three physiologic factors that I always keep 
um, in, in mind when I'm doing this is whether or not we can achieve steady state. And, you know, if that's actually a goal of our, our project, this question might not be relevant for specific experimental paradigms, what the expected end title to arterial CO2 gradients will be and how that might impact our ability to estimate arterial carbon dioxide, and then whether or not the method will be impacted by the magnitude of ventilation by our participants, and if this is important for our research question as well. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you to a few people. First off, uh, my PhD supervisor, Professor Phil Ainsley, who was um, uh, amazing as a, a mentor through a lot of this work. Um, and then the rest of the research teams that I got to work, work with when conducting this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rowling, for this very interesting uh, talk. I don't see uh, any like specific um, questions, so uh, I think we will move forward right away with uh, Dr. Uh, Sam Lucas from the University of Birmingham, Birmingham, who will address other important issues related to uh, CO2 reactivity. Okay, um, brilliant. Um, thanks, um, Pat. Uh, for the, uh, the introduction and, and I guess in hosting um, what is, um, I guess, a, a, an important topic um, that, of, that many of us, I guess, are, are playing around with. Um, and Ryan, for a, a really nice physiological uh, sort of grounding in terms of, 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 of how, we, how we're measuring this. So um, for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is uh, Dr. Sam Lucas. Um, I'm based here in Birmingham in, in the UK as part of the School of Sport, Exercise and Rehabilitation Sciences, and also linked in um, with the, the Centre for, for Human Brain Health. So I've done a presentation as part of the series already, and I really focused, I guess, around looking at this part of my, my research programme, how we can use exercise to improve brain health. But the other sort of big question that, that I guess I'm, I'm looking into is, is trying to understand how we actually measure um, this better. Um, how we measure brain health. So to just to outline what I'm going to cover, um, I guess do some, uh, some background um, to, to a project of looking at uh, what, what, we are, what we are measuring, you know, and what test is best in terms of reactivity. And then I'm going to, and it's almost, I guess, a little journey um, in terms of, um, of where I've come from and, and I guess to where I've got, um, and then sort of uh, present a couple of studies that we've done um, along this way. Um, just start my watch. So um, this is this is a slide I presented last time. You know, we just to kind of give us the context in terms of what we're into. We know that brain blood flow is important. We know it's important for survival. We know it has functional consequences. You know, and and lots of us are, are really interested in, in understanding how we can how we can improve it. One of the ways that we when we look at how to improve it, of course, is then to measure it. So we can measure resting flow. Um, and brain structure, um, but of course, we're also really interested in looking at the regulation of brain blood flow, and that's a real functional measure. Um, so to, to try and, I guess, put a, the context, as, as Ryan sort of um, really nicely put, um, you know, if we, if we want to understand the impact of an intervention or, or the impact of a disease, um, we want to we want to be able to measure that. Um, so, but kind of, it's a really important part of the step, I guess, is is to is actually to be very sure about what we're what we're actually measuring here. So, so first, I guess, is how, how do we measure this? So, we can um, going to look at I guess cerebrovascular responsiveness, and, and and talk about imaging modality as well. So. Um, cerebrovascular reactivity and Ryan's already touched on this and there's a number of different ways that that we can do that but this is I guess one measure within our responsiveness um, I guess toolkit that we've got um, you can also look at uh, brain vascular health through auto regulation and again there's a number of different ways that we do this um, we're not going to talk about this today um, I'm sure there's at least one maybe two seminar series that could touch on all of these different uh, these different methods and, and people have already talked talked about these um, also, we can look at the neurovascular coupling process um, mechanism as well as, as a way to quantify brain vascular health um, and, and other sort of stimulus on kinetics response and, and the exercise on kinetics. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to table this as the, the Billinger model. I, I really like what, what Sandy's doing with this on kinetics. And, and I wonder um, whether we can use this, whether we can use the CO2 um, response, and I guess, in, in a similar way. Um, and, and I think you can probably see some of that through what, what Ryan just presented. Um, and then, so we've got all these different ways that we can, I guess, 
look at a stimulus response. And then there's different ways that we're also measuring it in terms of um, an imaging modality uh, process. Um, so how do we measure brain blood flow? Um, well, we've got lots of different options, I guess. Um, uh, lots, I guess the selection is, is, can be determined by our research question, but often it really boils down to this in terms of what have, what's available to us um, is, also, is also an important, um, important consideration. But there are factors that we, that we know. It's very difficult to exercise in an upright position in, in an MRI. So looking at exercising type responses, um, as you know, Doppler and, and NIRS are, 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 are probably the best options for that. But looking at, you know, spatial and, and uh, different parts of the brain structure, MRI is, is probably better for that, um, for sure. Um, but I guess the, the real question that, 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 you know, I ask or have been asking um, is, you know, how do, these, how do these compare? You know, are they complementary or are they contradictory? And, and as I'll kind of go through this talk, I'll, I'll present, I guess, particularly the cerebrovascular reactivity measure. Um, in the literature, it's talked as or presented as the same thing, um, but um, it, is, it, it is quite different in terms of what we're actually measuring. And so this is, I guess, a real key question for me is, you know, when, we, when we're measuring this same outcome measure between these two different key imaging modalities, now, are we are we actually measuring the same thing? Um, and for me, this is something that I'm really uh, I'm really trying to move towards. And, and I, I know I'm lucky, based here in Birmingham, um, in the Centre of Human Brain Health, we do have access to all these different modalities. But I think this is a really key a key sort of uh, direction that I think you know we should be we should be thinking about trying to trying to use I guess a combination of these different methods to to, I guess, improve our, our understanding and our measurement of brain vascular health from a structural and a functional perspective. Okay, so that's sort of a little bit of a background in terms of, 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 of what, we're, what we're measuring. Um, of course, we're really going to focus on um, the cerebrovascular responsiveness, um, particularly around the steady state uh, 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 methodology, which, which Ryan's already presented. And I'm also going to look at um, particularly that response or that reactivity test between Doppler um, and, and MRI. Um, so as, as Ryan's presented, we're interested in this. We think this is a good measure of brain vascular health. There's, there's a number of studies that we, um, that we, that we know um, that have, I guess, shown its potential as a, as a, as a biomarker. So here's the Rotterdam study again, um, where we can see that, the, that there's a clear link between blunted or lower vasomotor reactivity to CO2 um, between um, and a risk of mortality. Um, so this is a very common study that, that, that we in the field will, will cite as, as, as evidence for the fact that it's a, it's a good biomarker. Here's, here's another one um, uh, from, from Damien Bailey and Phil Ainsley's involved in this work as well, you know, showing a pretty clear relationship between fitness and, and this cerebrovascular CO2 reactivity in both a young population and an older population. So these dark circles or filled in circles are, are the trained groups uh, and the open circles are, are the sedentary groups. So it looks, looks pretty clean in terms of a fitness effect. Um, and and another, another couple of studies here, again, showing that um, in cohorts, uh, so these are, these are professional boxes. So, who have got, I guess, chronic uh, traumatic brain injury, um, showing that their vascular reactivity to CO2 is, is blunted. And there's actually a direct correlation um, to sparring volume as, as, as well. So there, there seems to be a, a nice link here in terms of uh, TBI and this, this outcome measure that we're interested in, uh, and, as, and as well as um, a dementia uh, cohorts as well. You can see here relative to age match controls, um, there's a blunted or a, a lower vascular reactivity. So it looks convincing, right? Here's, you know, here's four examples of studies um, that show that there's a, um, you know, that it looks like it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty a clear biomarker. However, what I've tried to do here, it's a pretty busy table, um, but what I've tried to do is pull together um, a few, a few studies across um, I guess across literature that, that have used CVR as an outcome measure. 
Um, so I've color coded things in terms of green being what we would um, what we would I guess think is expected and consistent in terms of aging effects, fitness effects, disease effects, um, and the red is, is sort of highlighting what we would, I guess, typically think is inconsistent or, or unexpected. So to begin with, I guess, here's, here's um, I guess, a collection of studies that would present what we would think is consistent or, or expected. We're seeing links in terms of impaired or lower CVR, which are associated with, with disease or increased risk of death, um, as, as well as age-related declines um, and, 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 fitness, and fitness effects. Um, However, um, there are there are inconsistencies um, with with um, I guess this the simple the simple message, um, and and it may be also linked to what we're seeing. There could be sex differences as well. Um, there could be um, uh, so even within this study here, which is which is a study out of um, out of a lab I was linked to. I guess Phil's Phil's lab, Phil Ainsley's lab. Well, we see no expected age effect, but we do see an effect with increased fitness, um, which is which is interesting. Um, and then if we kind of then, so these are all TCD studies, these are all Doppler-based studies. Um, if we then look into the MRI literature, um, again, we can see that here's what we would expect in terms of age effects, disease effects with blunted or, or lower um, CVR. Um, however, um, there are other studies, again, within the MRI field, which, which would challenge or will show some inconsistencies. I think probably in, in the context of what Ryan just presented, um, I think what's really interesting is uh, here is just look at the variation in terms of how people are using a CVR method or methodology to elicit the stimulus um, response. So there's, there's lots of differences. We've got breath holding, we've got CO2, and we've got open circuit techniques or this fixed inspired CO2. We've got stepped um, examples of that. Uh, we've got um, one, one minute on, three minutes on, um, you know, all, all sorts of, of differences. And, and it's a very similar thing within the MR as well. So there's a lot of variability between how this is, how this is being, um, I guess, introduced or delivered. So for me, I guess a take a takeaway message from this is that there's several methods that we were using um, to, 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 I guess, produce this outcome measure. And I guess a real question that I have is, you know, what impact does, does this have? You know, and the commonly stated age and fitness effects are not universal. You know, this may depend on the method that we're using um, or and or it could be an imaging modality thing. And there could be, it could be, it could be important in the context of, of who you're testing, whether there's uh, age effects, um, there's, there's some studies which show that there's differences between females and males in opposite directions as well. There's a, a Doppler study which has shown um, that the sex effect or the age effect is only in females participants. And um, there's a recent study which has shown quite the opposite in terms of young versus older females. Um, don't uh, don't change their CVR, whereas the age-related decline is driven by the, the male cohort. So there's um, there, there's there's real inconsistencies uh, across the literature, and I think there's these uh, two recent conclusions. I guess kind of sum this up quite nicely that it's complex, um, and it's more complex than what we're I guess that than what we're putting across in the literature, and it may depend on on a number of different integrated complex relationships between chemosensitivity, autoregulation, um, and even changes in, I guess, vascular structure. All of these might be underpinning the relationship between age, fitness, and our cerebrovascular health. Um, and again, this is, these are sort of some of the things that, that Ryan just sort of talked about. Um, just to, I guess, shift gears a little bit, and, and, and I guess provide a couple of examples, or I guess a background to to how I sort of came into, into this sort of area. Um, and, and here's, um, uh, I guess, a study that I was involved in um, earlier in my postdoc with Phil, where we went to high altitude and, and, we, and we were interested in cerebrovascular reactivity and we used, an, a, a, I guess, a set of different um, methods to, to look at this. So here's the steady state, which, which Ryan has talked about. And here's a rebreathing protocol, which, um, which Ryan was gonna talk about, but he hasn't. Um, but it's, I guess it's a different method to, to look at the cerebrovascular reactivity. And, and to kind of, I guess, give you a context about what the data would look like, 
Here's a step change that we see with an open circuit steady state approach. So this is coming out of a Douglas bag, just as, as Ryan um, just introduced or talked about. And you can see the step change in our end tidal CO2. And we get, a, I guess, an increase in a, in a steady state response here in our vascular response. So this is, this is across a, uh, five minutes uh, from memory here where we see this response and this is i guess compared to a rebreathing approach where we get a, a ramped increase in co2 we're rebreathing uh, co2 is increasing with each breath um, breath breath by breath and, and we see an increase um, uh, uh, i guess a ramp increase in our, in our co2 um, response so when we're calculating our, our cvr um, for the steady state we're looking at i guess this this change response uh, between baseline and our steady state versus the slope response that we, that we have um, with the with the rebreathing, and the reason I kind of I really want to highlight this is, um, I think this this study or these sets of data are a really nice illustration of um, of the fact that you can get a different outcome or different result reporting the same outcome. So if we talk about cerebrovascular reactivity to CO two, we would generally say that that's what it is. Um, but depending on which circuit or which um, a method that we've used here, we've got we've got a completely different outcome. So here's the steady state open circuit response where we see a reduction in, in the CVR measure versus the rebreathing um, protocol, a closed circuit, where we see an increase. And this is it's worth, I guess, pointing out that these are the same people at this, with the same environmental stressor, given the same CO2 stimulus, which was 5% CO2 in a hyperoxia. Um, background and within the same testing block. So these tests were all done within about an hour, an hour and a half of each other. But the, the fact that we're delivering it in a different way gives us quite a different outcome. Now that's fine, right? We, we know and there's well-established and accepted physiology that explains this. And, and, and Ryan's presented that really nicely um, just before. I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that does this, does this create some confusion? Right. For those that don't read Journal of Physiology, you'll note that you know that the, all three of these papers mentioned here are in you know the Journal of Physiology. These are you know I guess physiology-based um, studies. When we're looking broad, more broadly across our field, you know what are we what are we doing in terms of creating or setting up some inconsistencies and some confusion? I guess um, that's out there. So this really, I guess, sort of drove, I guess, the question, my, the, the first project that I, I really wanted to do when I, when I got to Birmingham was, was to, to, to do this. And I was very fortunate to get a, a little uh, a startup grant, I guess, from the, the Physiology Society, which was around, I guess, the overall aim or objective was to, to, was to establish a robust through the vascular CO2 responsiveness test that we could use to assess brain health. And that would be robust. Um, reliable, and it's something we could then use in, in, a, in a hospital session, hospital setting. So we had, I had three. Well, we had three specific aims to this, um, which was to compare the different methods for assessing CVR, to compare the CVR measures determined by TCD and MRI, and then to develop and, and, and validate a robust, clinically transferable, methodological approach. <laughs> and when I went back and looked at this, I mean, it's laughable, really, that I've gave myself twelve months. Um, to, to, to do this. You know, this is, this is easily a career, um, probably two, to, to try and, and try and sort this out. Uh, to be fair, I mean, this is obviously with, with the benefit of, of hindsight now. Um, but yeah, this, this was, I guess, where, where, where I started. And, and Claire Burley, Dr. Claire, Dr. Claire Burley, um, this was, I guess, the start of, of, start of her, her PhD work, where, again, our, our aim was to come in and, and sort this all out within a year, set up a test that we could then use to determine changes in brain vascular health as a consequence of, of, the, of, the, of the most awesome exercise intervention. Claire's PhD was, was told, basically wholly, I guess, tied up around these first two, first, two, first two aims. And in fact, her first postdoc carried us on as well. So what I'm going to present today is, I guess, some, some findings from, from this work. Um, and in particular, I guess, these, these two first questions um, that we did. So just again, just some quick back, background, really. Now, this, this CVR outcome measure, we re, we're using this to assess brain vascular health. And, and you know, we're, we do this because we're, 
uh, you know, there's this perceived and 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 stated a reported link to stroke risk, and, and it's and it's lower in, in a number of different neurodegenerative disease cases. Um, but as I sort of presented in, in the table, there's there's a lot of variability um, around how the stimulus is presented, and one of the key ones is the duration of the of the CO2 stimulus. So, and this can range from from one minute to five minute. You know, and we know that there's some on kinetics with this. Ryan presented that really nicely. That may mean that a one minute uh, response is, is very different to a, a five minute response. Um, and there was, there was, I guess, two key papers or one paper in particular, which really stimulated my thinking around this was, it was a paper by uh, Thomas and colleagues out of, out of Texas which showed that there was a blunted CVR response in, in a set of masters athletes. And in the context of how they delivered the gas, um, what they did was they were using one minute cycles of 5% CO2. And if you contrast that with the three minute steady state that was used in, in the Bailey study, which showed that higher CVR response in both younger um, and, and older fitter groups, um, this, I guess, really sort of set off this, this, this original question for me. Um, I guess going, and another, uh, another question that kind of emerged out of this was um, I got involved in some work using brain stimulation, and, and, and in that field, they were using CVR as well. But in a, the way that they were, I guess, analyzing their data was that they were looking at a steady state from um, the, after the first 90 seconds of the, of the onset of the stimulus and taking taking that average point as their as their steady state up until that point most of my focus or understanding or exposure to it had been looking at the i guess the last minute or 30 seconds off the back of a, a four or a five minute stimulus so it made me wonder again given the kinetics of the response you know how did this then affect this this outcome measure so I guess that really set up two key aims that we had um, within this work, uh, where we, we had 18 people come in um, and we ran them through a, a, a familiarization where we, we gave them, we exposed them to the one minute and the, and the five minute duration. Then they came back in for their experimental trial and we put them through in a single visit um, without taking the headset off and everything. So that the, so the Doppler's headset was was in the same spot um, for each of these, we would expose them to four different durations, a, a, a one, a two, a four, and, and a five minute. And these were randomized between um, the people that, um, between, between our participants. Um, we, we also um, then, during our analysis, looked at the differences between um, these, I guess, these time points of, of steady state, shall we call it, so um, around, um, that, that 60 seconds, 90 seconds from stimulus onset versus, um, uh, I guess, the end of end of a steady state block, whether this is an example of, of our four minute protocol that we used. And we also um, just, I guess, to, to round it all out, looked at the difference between taking a 60 second steady state versus a, a 30 second steady state. And for this, we, of course, we measured our, our TCD um, with our middle cerebral artery um, outcome measure. Of course, measured our respiratory gases, particularly our entitled CO2 and, and, and other cardiorespiratory, cardiovascular um, outcomes. In terms of, um, I guess, an, an example trace, um, this, is, um, this is what uh, a single participant looked like um, when we uh, did, a, I guess, a moving average across um, their uh, breath by breath responses. I'm not quite as tight as what Ryan just presented, but as you can see here, this is this is the stimulus onset. A little bit of variation here um, in, in the context of the wider cohort. Um, this was actually a, a, only about five percent of variability within the cohort, uh, and again with the open circuit, um, with that interaction between the I guess the, the ventilation, um, it's not clamped. Um, you know, you're you're going to get some some variability. Um, and you can see that there is a bit of variability, I guess, across um, uh, the, the period here. Uh, and similarly with our, with our vascular responses, uh, we get a nice, um, I guess, increase on kinetics. Um, and then you can see the trace across um, each of the durations. So that's, that's an example of, of for one participant across our, 
uh, four different conditions. In terms of in terms of our outcome measure, I guess our key findings rather, um, I guess the takeaway was yeah, duration does matter. Um, what we what we saw was that our two minute protocol gave us the highest CVR outcome. Um, and that was whether we were looking at the relative change or the absolute change from, from baseline. Um, and and our, our four minute was, was, was the lowest on average. And I guess what was, I guess, a little bit frightening really was the variability that we saw um, across each of the, or across these different stimulus durations within a participant. And this ranged from 7% right up to, to 46%. So some, quite a lot of variation um, within, an, within an individual across these, these different durations of the same stimulus. Um, because, we were, because we're dealing with the open circuit, it, it's, it's worth also presenting, I guess, the ventilatory response because it's, it's tied up to it. And I guess it's no surprise that our lowest vascular responses um, at four and five minutes um, were associated with, with, with the highest ventilatory sensitivity outcome. So it takes a little longer for the, for the ventilatory response, um, I guess, to, to, to take effect. Um, and, and between the, the one and the four or five minute durations, there was, there was a threefold increase. And again, in terms of the variability that we're seeing, certainly a lot more variability um, the, the, for these longer duration versus, versus these shorter duration responses. Okay, so the duration of the response certainly had an effect um, in terms of the time point of the steady state response. That too um, had, had an effect. So when we compared uh, our steady state taken from the end of the period versus after the first minute, um, what we saw is that um, but for both the four and the five minute, there was a significant difference in terms of our CVR outcome. The two minute response wasn't different and that kind of makes sense because we're effectively measuring, measuring the same thing. In the context of the 60 versus 30 seconds, um, so whether these, whether it was the outcome was different between these two, we saw, we saw no difference. So it doesn't seem to make any difference whether you take a 30 second average or a 60 second average, you, you get the same CBR outcome. So really, I guess the conclusion um, from that um, is that it, yeah, the stimulus duration does alter our CVR outcome, and so does the steady state time point. So we need to be careful, um, and careful particularly when we're comparing studies in the literature with different CO2 stimulus durations. And I guess it highlights really that we, we need to have a more consistent approach because it does alter our CVR outcome. Um, I guess questions um, that, that um, I seem to have more questions than answers from all this work, um, but one of the things that, uh, that, that um, has, has, has twigged my interest really is, is whether the, the different, different types or the different durations of open circuit are, are actually assessing the same thing. You know, so in terms of the longer duration, looking at a more, I guess, a, a more fully integrated response, versus an initial on kinetics if we, if we look at a, a shorter, shorter duration response. You know, should we be targeting the peak response? You know? So where this actually peaks, um, how does that differ across the durations? You know, how, how can we, how can we um, I guess, analyze our data in a way that, I guess, highlights or, or targets that? And um, um, some of you might have read Joe Fisher's recent um, review that was just in the frontiers. And he um, may argue that, you know, that the, the role of ventilation in this open circuit technique just provides so much, I guess, noise that maybe this, the, the input from ventilation is just too much of a, of a confounder to ever make this approach reliable. Um, but we really need to think about how we can, how we can develop, I guess, a gold standard approach or yeah, to, to try and improve how we can use this in a more robust way. So that's, I guess, the, the first study uh, to, to, I guess, to kind of um, introduce or to, to talk about some of the work around um, what, what we've been doing. And, and the, other, the other piece of, of, of work um, uh, around this is really looking at um, comparing uh, TCD and, and MRI. And this is um, where my collaboration with, with Karen um, Mullinger began. 
um and 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 it's um she's i definitely come into this very naive about um i guess the whole mri approach and, and karen has been very very patient <laughs> talking me through um uh, and, and and i guess working with me on this and i, and I think we're, we're now in a, in, a, in a place where um you know we're starting to make a little bit of headway about trying to bring these two approaches uh together so this is really as i say um, this uh, trying to answer this question really you know, are, we, are we looking at something which are these two different imaging modalities giving us something which is complementary or contradictory and as I've mentioned and this is a, a real key part of, of Claire's PhD and I guess it's just to really come back to this this table and and compare and, and look at these different imaging modalities that, that we have and and it doesn't seem to matter which whether, whether you're looking at tcd or or mri there's inconsistencies um, within both of these but just to, i guess highlight um two or three key papers that that really set set us on this i guess on this journey was trying to understand particularly this the thomas et al finding where they short saw this blunted cvr response in these masters athletes and, and, up, and up until that point um, it, well, that study, I guess, really flew in the face of what we'd been, um, what we'd been, I guess, uh, most comfortable with, that there is an age-related decline and, and that fitness improves our CVR. But I guess the key point, so we've talked a little bit about the duration um, that, that's different between these, these three studies, but of course, obviously, uh, the imaging modality is, is different as well. Um, so... Just to, I guess I know the overall aim really of of this work was was to assess the relationship between our CBR metrics derived from two commonly uh, through through two common imaging modalities that being TCD and bold MRI and, and in the context of MRI bold is 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 by far and away the most used um, I guess sequence or metric within the MRI world. Um, Karen's going to talk uh, uh, in a lot more detail about this and, and the other options. But this, this question really, the study was primarily looking at, at trying to compare these two common approaches. And I guess a key, a key difference here, and, and I guess the novel part of the study, was to take the same people um, and take a group of people that we expected to be different um, in terms of younger versus older. And we also tried to get some fitness uh, differences as well two different fitness groups within these age cohorts and put them through um, the, the, the same protocol, um, the, same, uh, the same CO2 reactivity task in both these imaging modalities so that we could then look at the difference between these imaging modalities um, to determine the, the true effect of, of differences in imaging modality. So we did this, I guess, across two, two studies in, in, a, in a serial manner. Um, the first study we had uh, 20 young and then 15 older participants. And these were split into fit and unfit um, uh, sub-cohorts. Um, and then we followed this up with a, with a second study where we took um, fit young and sedentary older people to try and really separate, um, uh, I guess, that, that expected effect. So the first study, so some of the sequencing was a, a little bit different, um, but ultimately what I'm going to present here is, is really looking at the CO2 effect. So looking at this CVR outcome um, that we that we use within the, the MRI um, and uh, what we did with, with the Doppler as well. So we, we set up uh, the same open circuit um, uh, method. We used exactly the same apparatus. So we transported a uh, breathing apparatus, our gas analyzer, our tubes. Um, our sample line was the same distance. All of that was um, we, we moved that between our two sites so that we were trying to, so the guiding principle really was that we wanted to look at the, exactly the same CO2 delivery method within the same people. Um, in, in the end, seven, the 7% 7 CO2 um, uh, wasn't tolerated very well um, with the number of participants. So we, we, we didn't get enough data ready to, to use that. So we're just presenting, um, and we're just using, I guess, this, this 5% CO2. So in terms of our key findings, um, so here we've got um, our TCD, our Doppler CVR outcome measure, and our bold CVR, so this is our MRI outcome. Um, and what we see when we compare our younger versus older cohort, so we're, we're just looking at the age effect here, um, what we see is that 
Uh, with TCD, we had a higher CVR outcome um, in our older participants, whereas with the bold, we didn't see um, any difference at all. Uh, and I guess what was interesting is that we saw no correlation uh, between these two CVR outcomes. Um, what we then did is we took the, the we tried to I guess find that the extreme ends of the, of the of the cohort. So we took the youngest, the fit young cohort, and we and we compared that to the to the the older unfit cohort. Um, we lost our significance, but we can we still see I guess the the, the, the same the same story here that for the older people we see, we saw on average higher CVR outcome and no and no real difference between our cohorts with our with our MRI data. Um, so then in study two, um, we really targeted um, uh, uh, just those, I guess, those two extremes. Um, and again, we see, so this is now only, in, I guess, in, in 10 younger, 10 older people, we see the same thing. We see an increase or an elevated CVR outcome um, in our older versus younger cohort. Um, and this time we see, a, a, the, I guess, vice versa, the opposite with our, with our bold MRI CVR outcome. And, and, and not surprisingly, we definitely don't see a correlation between these two, these two CVR outcomes. Um, so then we, we were, what we then did is, is, I guess, pulled the two studies together so we could increase, increase the N. Again, looking at the, the, the 5% CO2, so we had the same stimulus, looking at, at the bold CVR outcome versus the TCD, um, the Doppler-based CVR outcome. Um, again, we see, a, a, I guess, a, a significant, consistent uh, difference in our young versus our older cohort. Again, the old cohort, the older cohort had an elevated CVR, um, wasn't significant, but on average, we see this, this, this lower CVR um, bold outcome in the older participants. So this was, I guess, vice versa, the opposite. Um, and, and no surprise, I guess, that we, we don't see a correlation between these two outcomes. So this is, I guess, my last sort of, uh, well, last slide related to, the, to, the, to that study. It's just something to think about. And Karen's going to talk a lot about this, so I won't spend too much time on this. But I just kind of want to point out, really, that, um, that we're seeing we've got quite different blood flow responses depending on where we are in our, in our vascular tree. Now, we know within the Doppler literature that depending on which vessel we're looking at, anterior versus posterior, we see different responses in terms of our CVR response. Well, there is also differences, so I guess, um, I guess along the vascular tree as, as, as well. And this is, this is some modeling work that's, that's been done um, and to show really where, where differences are um, across or a, a, along, the vascular, along the vascular tree. And I guess what's, what's important to point out here is that what we're measuring with Doppler is here in the arterial, um, in the artery, um, but what we're measuring with bold responses is, um, is on the venous side of, of, uh, of, the, of the picture here as well. So it's, it's perhaps not all that unsurprising that we are seeing differences between these two different imaging modalities because we're actually measuring something which is um, physiologically or anatomically at, at different parts of, of the vascular tree. So in conclusion, um, our findings from both those two studies that we, that we ran um, show that there was no clear relationship between TCD and the bold CVR outcomes. And it's worth noting here that this is, this is despite the age-related differences in resting blood flow measures that we saw across these modalities. So I haven't presented that here, but just to, so I guess the more well-established, better established resting blood flow responses, um, they, they did correlate well when we were looking at, I guess, uh, the, the velocity as measured by Doppler or the transit time as measured by the MRI. We see um, I guess, I guess consistency or correlations with, with those. So in our resting measures, we do see um, a good relationship between our modalities. That seems to make sense is when we start to introduce the stimulus response um, protocol that we, that we that I guess the, the story unpacks a little bit. So we hypothesize that these differences between our energy modalities are in part due to the aspects, the different aspects of the vascular tree that we're assessing. Um, what I think is very clear that we that we really need to 
that we need to acknowledge and, and, and face is that we really need to be careful about when we're comparing CVR metrics, which have been derived from different imaging modalities. And I guess this is a, a really um, a key point uh, and a good example here is when we're comparing the, 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 the Bailey and colleagues work versus the, the master's athletes that were presented in, in the Thomas paper. Um, to try and put a positive spin on this, <laughs> I think um, we, need to, we need to do a lot more work to really understand, um, I guess, the source of these discrepancies. And in doing that, I think that will enable us to better utilise and then uh, in a way that can be complementary and targeted in a multimodal imaging way to determine brain health. Um, and I think what's quite exciting is because we know and we can see that there's differences um, within a cohort when you're using these different techniques, what that may mean is that we can we can actually use that to target, um, be more precise about the parts of the vascular tree which are compromised by disease um, and, and how we can, I guess, target our assessment and therefore understand, I guess, the, 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 the effectiveness of, the, of any intervention that, that we're doing. And I guess this kind of comes back really to, I guess, my point about that what's important is that we that we combine our methods that we're using to, to better assess brain health so we can look at both the structure and the function of, of brain of the brain vasculature. And to do that, I think we need to have a, I guess, a more multimodal approach. So to kind of bring it back to, I guess, the idea of this of the seminar is, is really, um, you know, is through the vascular reactivity a biomarker? You know, is it you know, is it the singing canary that that we that we often we often talk about? And I want to say yes. You know, I, I, there's clearly data, there's clearly studies out there, strong large studies that that show that it's that it's useful. Um, I guess the point I want to make really is that there may be more than one biomarker, depending on what imaging modality that you're using or or how you deliver that and assess that that delivery that stimulus response. What's the best approach? Um, you know, are the commonly currently used approaches the best way forward? Um, breath holding, open circuit gas deli delivery, or acetazolamide are they the best approaches that we can that we can use? Um, steady state versus dynamic responses. Should we be? Could we be? Could we focus on on, on this this part of of, of the vascular um, response? Um, may may that may that may be more reliable um, than that. Um, in, a, in a maybe in an open circuit type approach, um, um, and, and I think that it's it's worth acknowledging that, that there are techniques that that as Ryan presented in terms of entitled clamping or or um, targeted gas delivery, which which does enable us to give us a bit more control over the entitled CO two. Um, so maybe maybe that's something that we should all be moving towards. Um, I guess one caveat to that that argument really is that um, I guess and you know, how deliverable is this or how, how translatable is that out into into, um, into into clinics, for example? Yeah, beautiful research tools, and I think in terms of understanding the physiology better, I think it, I think these are a great way forward. Um, I think uh, you know how that might translate to being able to use, be used in a clinic is, is I guess another question and another challenge that we need to think about. Um, so for those that you don't don't know, there is actually a special topic in Frontiers around this. Um, there's there's 15 articles already within this. Um, there might be some more that's coming out. And, and, and I guess the paper that I've sort of presented here, the second study is, um, has, has been provisionally accepted and, um, and, and hopefully that the final proof will be, will be available very, very soon. Um, and with that, I just wanted to thank the, I guess, the key people really that, that, have, that I've, I guess I've worked with um, through this have been absolutely uh, fantastic in terms of opening my eyes um, and understanding across this, um, this interesting question and of course the funders that um, supported the work. And thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, for another fascinating talk. And I thought our cerebral autoregulation community had their fair amount of uh, <laughs> methodological issues to deal with. So we are we are not alone in there. <laughs> exactly. We just didn't want to be left out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I've I've seen a few questions, but again, uh, we will uh, uh, wait until the end of the the third uh, presented 
the third talk to uh, to have the discussion. So um, the last speaker, not the least, uh, Dr. Karen Mullinger from uh, the University of Birmingham and Nottingham will add a layer of issues um, uh, regarding CO2 reactivity. Right. Okay, so um, yeah, how did I come um, into this area of cerebral vascular reactivity? My background is using multimodal imaging to look at um, brain function and understand brain function. So um, when Sam approached me saying many years ago now saying, I want to do um, CBR with MRI, I was like, okay, let's have a go. Um, and since then, as you will have seen, we've started to uncover um, quite a complex picture. But what I'm going to be talking about is how we can use um, MRI and what measurements MRI is give, are giving us in terms of cerebral vascular reactivity. So I'm going to be talking about which MRI sequences we can um, use to measure CVR, what each of those sequences is actually measuring, how we then calculate CVR with each of those sequences and examples where each sequence has been used. And then at the end, talk a, a kind of give an overview of the advantages and disadvantages of the different methods and what to think about when you might be wanting to do CVR experiments with MRI. So unlike Doppler, with MRI, we can measure lots of different things. Um, and so what you use to measure CVR varies between studies, as Sam has already um, alluded to. So the most common method is um, the bold contrast or blood oxygen level dependent contrast. This method is easy, easy to use got high signal to noise, but as we'll see, isn't a very direct measure of blood flow. We then have arterial spin labeling. Um, great in the fact that it's actually looking at the perfusion of blood into the um, gray matter tissue, um, but much lower signal to noise um, and a bit more complicated to um, analyze the data. And then phase contrast angiography or PCA, um, which can measure um, the flow or the velocity of blood in any blood vessel in the brain. Um, so this is probably the most um, similar to the Doppler methods that some of you will be more familiar with. So with each of these, I'm just gonna go through what we're really looking at with them. So with the bold signal, what are we actually measuring? Well, if we have some sort of gas challenge, we know that we have a release of um, vasodilators, which causes um, signaling, which causes a vascular response and an increase in blood flow. This increase in blood flow um, will get all the way down to the capillaries and into the veins and will result in an increase in oxyhemoglobin relative to deoxyhemoglobin. And it's actually um, the change in the concentration of oxyhemoglobin relative to deoxyhemoglobin, which um, is key to driving the bold signal um, because oxyhemoglobin has different magnetic properties to deoxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin. And so when we have our increase in blood flow, we have an increase in oxyhemoglobin as well as blood volume. And this causes a local um, change in the magnetic field, um, which causes an increase in the MRI signal. And this is the origin of the bold signal. So if we have a stimulus, which is shown in red here, that's on for a period of time, then in that brain region, then the bold signal will then increase. Um, each time we have our increase in the amount of oxyhemoglobin. Now this increase can be driven simply by gas challenge or it can be driven by neuronal activity. So the bold um, signal can be driven by many different things. All it's actually telling you is about changes in the amount of oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin and um, blood volume changes. So where are we measuring um, these changes? Well, at rest, we have um, our uh, vascular tree and we have oxygenated blood flowing in through the arteries and then the oxygen gets taken up um, in the capillary bed. And then we have um, a higher level of deoxyhemoglobin in the venules and veins. 
when we have a gas challenge, um, then we have an increase in our blood flow and our blood volume. Um, we assume that we have a similar uptake of oxygen um, by the tissue, and therefore we have an increase in the amount of oxyhemoglobin within the um, venules and veins. And so the bold signal is really originating from this area of the vascular tree here. But the bold signal, as I've already mentioned, is really driven by lots of different things. So yes, we have increase in blood flow, which is driving the bold signal, but also any change in oxygen metabolism is going to affect our bold signal because it will affect the amount of oxyhemoglobin relative to deoxyhemoglobin. Now, a carbon dioxide um, stimulus is generally um, used to be isometabolic, but um, Hall and Driver have both shown using um, MEG, um, which measures the neuronal signals from the brain, that there are changes in the neuronal signaling um, when you give a CO2 challenge. So maybe this isn't actually constant and maybe this is affecting the bold signal as well. Also, as I've mentioned, the blood volume will also be affecting the bold signal and the change in blood volume. So all of these things add together, but then on top of this, we've also got to consider baseline levels of um, deoxyhemoglobin, baseline levels of blood volume and oxygen metabolism, as all of these will also affect um, our bold signal. And then finally, if this wasn't enough things to be thinking about, we also need to think about our imaging parameters, the MRI field strength that we're collecting the data at, as well as the echo time and the um, MRI sequence. So collectively, all of these things are um, giving us the bold signal. So it's not just measuring this blood flow that perhaps um, is the only thing we're interested in um, when we're considering CVR, but we've got a complicated mixture of all of these different factors, some of which we can control for, um, but many which we can't. But if we accept this and go, well, bold signal um, has a brilliant signal to noise and gives us um, great spatial information, then how do we actually calculate CVR um, from it? Now here um, is an example of how CVR can be calculated. We have an average um, bold signal over the whole of the gray matter, which is shown in this blue line here. And then our end tidal CO2 trace for the same um, participant measured at the same time. Um, in orange. Now, because of all of the tubing, the um, temporal alignment of these thing, of these two traces isn't perfect. And so what we tend to do is, first of all, temporally align them to maximize their correlation. Once we have them um, temporally aligned, we can use our end tidal CO2 trace within a general linear model um, where we model all of the different things that might be affecting the bold signal. So our first column here is our end tidal CO2 trace. We then have a linear regressor, um, which is modeling any drift in the bold signal, and then all of our motion parameters. And here at the bottom, we have the equation um, for this. So Y is our data, our bold signal from an individual voxel within the brain. Um, X1 is our um, end tidal CO2 trace, and what we're interested in for our CVR measure is this beta one weight, because this beta weight is going to give us our measure of CVR, because effectively this is the gradient of a line. And what we need to bear in mind, given everything that Ryan and um, Sam have been talking about, is the fact that we're using the whole of this end tidal CO2 trace um, to derive this beta weight. So it isn't a certain time window, it's the whole trace. But using this method, um, there's been many studies using this method. And this study here was um, performing a four minute stimulus and a one minute stimulus and showing the CVR maps um, when using bold are very, very similar for these two um, different duration of gas challenges. And you'll notice here that our units of CVR in the case of um, using bold, a percentage change of bold, um, divided by the change in end tidal CO2. So as Sam's mentioned already, this um, study by Thomas um, used uh, bold CVR measures to look at changes between masters athletes and sedentary older people, showing that the masters athletes had a lower CVR and you can see that they get these beautiful spatial maps of how bold is changing. 
This study by um, Kenny used it to look at the changes between TBI and healthy control, showing that TBI patients had a lower CVR um, when measured with bold CVR than um, healthy controls. And as you've already heard, we've also used bold CVR to look at changes between younger and older people. So the next method I want to talk about is um, ASL. So ASL um, is another method from which we can um, measure um, CVR. And in this method, what we do is we tag the blood um, in the neck using um, magnetic pulses. So we effectively creating an indigenous contrast agent by magnetically tugging the blood. We then image the brain. And um, what we're doing is looking at the, uh, the movement of that magnetically tagged blood up into the gray matter tissue. Now to do this, what we have to do is um, obviously allow a set time between the magnetic tagging of the blood in the neck um, and the image. And this is known as the post-label delay or the inversion time, depending on which ASL sequence you use. So there's many different types of ASL sequence. But um, the key to this is the fact that if we um, allow too much time, then um, the signal will have disappeared. But if we um, don't allow enough time, then the um, blood won't have moved from the neck up into the brain. And so um, defining this inversion time is very important for actually correctly um, obtaining your CVR measures. So what's driving our ASL signal? Well, blood flow is a large driver of the ASL signal, which is a good sign. Um, but we've also got to consider the labeling efficiency. So how well we've magnetically tagged the blood within the neck. So um, if the blood is moving faster then the labeling efficiency is lower and also the inversion time. So the length of time we're allowing from um, the blood moving from the neck to when we're doing the imaging as all of these things are going to affect the ASL signal. Where in the vascular tree are we actually getting this ASL signal from? Well, it will be coming from the capillary bed um, because as I've mentioned, we're looking at the perfusion of this blood into the gray matter. So in this imaging sequence, we're very much looking at the microvasculature. So, with ASL, um, which is obviously a more direct measure of blood flow, what do we get in terms of a CVR measure? Well, in this top plot um, by Furby and colleagues, what we can see um, is uh, the bold signal from different um, subjects, all shown in by different red lines. And in the blue lines are the um, concordant uh, ASL signals. So you can see the ASL signal is much, much noisier. In this study, the way they got CVR was to take this average signal over the whole brain for either the bold or the ASL signal and regress that with their end tidal CO2 traces. So very similar to the GLM sort of method that I mentioned. And then they find that they have really very good correlation between the bold and the CVR, um, sorry, the bold and the ASL CVR measures. However, another way, if you want some spatial information, um, which is often why you're going to be doing MRI, um, if you want some spatial information, but you're using ASL, the way that it's done is to average over time windows. So much more um, similar to what um, Sam has been talking about, where we take an average of the um, CBF measures during the gas challenge and during baseline and use those to create a relative CVR measure. Um, Gautier and colleagues have done a number of studies um, in this way um, using ASL and BOLD um, and with their ASL when they compare younger and older people they find a decline within the whole of um, grey matter as well as the frontal um, right frontal region when they use ASL but with BOLD they see a change in all of the brain regions that they um, evaluate. Um, the same group have gone on to um, more recently look at younger and older people and bold and ASL CVR measures. So the top one's bold and the bottom one's ASL CVR measures. And um, what they're now doing is looking at correlations of CVR with um, fitness, so VO2 
um, max. And what they find is that there's no correlation between their CVR measures from ASL or BOLD um, with, within the younger people, but within the older people, they see a steady decline of um, CVR um, with increased fitness. Now, interestingly, another recent study by Foster and colleagues has also used ASL um, and correlated it um, with uh, VO2 max, so ASL CVR correlated with VO2 max. This time, however, they actually accounted for um, different transit times in different people by taking lots and lots of images um, at different transit times, um, different inversion times, sorry. And so by taking lots of images at different inversion times, um, they've accounted for changes in the blood getting from the neck to the brain. And with this, they're seeing this um, positive um, correlation between CVR and VO2 max. So even within ASL literature, there are different um, methodologies that are coming out with different results. So finally, phase contrast and geography, which I will call PCA, and I'm not referring to the artery. Um, P PCA is um, driven by blood flow, and as I've said, is the most similar to um, Doppler techniques. Um, and the only MRI imaging parameters that we really need to worry about are the velocity encoding imaging parameter, um, which we have to set to be the maximum velocity that we um, expect the blood to flow through the blood vessel. If we set it too high, then we don't have very much sensitivity to the true velocity of the blood. If we set it too low, then um, we won't be able to measure the higher velocities. And also the slice orientation, we need to make sure our slice is perfectly perpendicular to the blood vessel of interest. But if we account for these, then um, our PCA signal is reflecting um, our blood flow. Where can we measure it from? Well, we can measure it from really any um, vessel that has a large enough diameter to give us a sufficient signal to noise. So we can measure it from arteries or we can measure it from veins. What do we get? Well, we get an image like this, which is our blood vessel, which we then draw a region of interest around. And then that region of interest will um, change through the cardiac cycle um, and map the dilation of the blood vessel. And from this, what we can get is both um, the mean velocity within our region of interest, but also because we know the cross-sectional area of our um, vessel, we can work out the blood flow. Um, through that vessel as well. Now, this is um, across cardiac phases. So this is one cardiac cycle, but it's not acquired within one cardiac cycle. It takes around 30 seconds to a minute, and then the data is stitched together um, to give this average picture. So because it takes around 30 seconds to a minute to acquire one um, a reading, then what we do is we acquire one PCA image during um, the resting period and one during the gas challenge and then calculate relative CVR um, from that. Now this study by Miller and colleagues has done this for um, using 4D PCA um, sequence so that they're able to look over many blood vessels simultaneously. And they found that using PCA CVR measures, they had a significant difference between younger um, and older adults from all of their blood vessels. Now I keep saying that PCA um, is the most similar to Doppler, but this work by Lung has shown that there's not a very good correlation um, between CVR measured with TCD and CVR measured with PCA. In a subsection of the um, subjects that um, we studied, then we found the same thing. So in some of our subjects, we had PCA measures, and um, these were the subjects in study two. And in um, these subjects, we found no correlation between our PCA um, CVR measures and our TCD CVR measures. So clearly more work is needed to fully understand this. However, a more promising result um, by Chiang and colleagues is comparing all of the MRI methods. So here they've compared ASL, PCA and BOLD. Now the PCA here has been done over the superior sagittal sinus, which is a vein taking a lot of the blood away from the brain. Um, so different from the middle cerebral artery, which is the um, 
the vessel that we targeted within our study. But what they found is that there's a significant correlation um, between all three um, different Im MR imaging techniques, although they didn't correct for multiple comparisons but interestingly when they then also compare between young and old they only find that phase contrast angiography um, gives them a significant difference between their young and their old group whereas ASL and BOLD did not. In our work um, we've done many comparisons between obviously the TCD and the BOLD but also with um, PCA CVR measures of velocity and of flow. What's interesting is the velocity and the flow measures and the pattern between the two groups seems to go in opposite directions which might help um, explain the differences that we're seeing between the TCD and the um, BOLD, but also we see no correlation between our PCA flow measures and our BOLD, but our PCA um, measures, as I was saying, came from the middle cerebral artery, whereas Chang's um, PCA measures came from the superior sagittal sinus. So the, um, given that BOLD is more venously weighted, this might explain the discrepancies. So finally, things to consider, um, first of all, if you want to do use MRI to measure CVR, which method should you measure? Well, uh, use well if you want a direct measure of blood flow, um, then don't use bold um, because it doesn't give you a direct measure of blood flow. Um, but if you want good spatial and temporal information, then bold is your best um, way forward. Um, PCA will give you very little information. ASL will give you a bit more, but because of the lower signal to noise ratio of ASL compared with um, both bold and PCA, then you tend to have to do averaging either in the spatial or the temporal domain. In terms of ease of acquisition. Well, BOLD is very easy to acquire and is available on all um, MRI scanners. PCA is also available on all MRI scanners, um, but the problem with it can be um, the positioning of the slices. ASL depends on which technique you want, but um, getting this technique can, um, working on your scanner can be more challenging and also um, the analysis is more involved, which is why I've left that um, square blank. So um, as Sam already mentioned, this work by Peter Jessard's group um, is the final thing that I want to end on. Um, really just thinking about where on the vas in the vascular tree do you um, want to be doing your imaging? and um, therefore taking your CVR measures from. Um, because with PCA, um, you can be at either end of the vascular tree, with ASL, you're gonna be in the middle, and with BOLD, you're gonna to be towards um, the venous end of the vascular tree. And given that the hypercapnia and normal capnia reactivity um, changes and um, changes in reactivity between hypercapnia and normal capnia are different in different parts of the vascular tree, then we need to really be thinking about where in the vascular tree we want to be targeting. So I will end thanking um, much the same people that Sam thanked, um, but also thanking um, Molly Bright and Nick Blockley for um, very useful conversations um, on CVR measures with MRI, um, as they do lots of work in this field too. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for another insightful uh, talk. Uh, we definitely have def definitely have a lot to think before working or designing our next uh, CVR uh, studies. Uh, do not hesitate to, um, to write your question in the chat. We already have a few. Um, I think the first two who were related to blood pressure has been answered uh, by um, Ryan in the chat. So I will go directly with the next question from Andrew Boding. Uh, I think it, it was uh, for Sam. For the MRI studies, were the bold the CVR quantified across the entire brain or was it limited to only the brain region primarily perfused by the MCA? Uh, I, guess, I guess Karen's probably um, in a way answered a, a lot of that um, in, her, in her talk. Um, so Andrew, are you happy with, um, with that response? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to defer to Karen anyway, so... Where I was going to say, <laughs> um, I, would, uh, I would answer that in a 
couple of ways. We did we did do it over the whole grey matter. So um, what you're seeing in those plots is over the whole of the grey matter. But we did actually also create a region of interest which was just over um, the motor area, um, and uh, tried correlating that with the Doppler in case it was um, region specific. But we didn't see any correlation even if we used a smaller ROI that was being fed by the MCA. Great. Um, next question from John Ashley. Great talk, Dr. Lucas. Your data suggested there were differences with TCD CVR related to duration. Were the times of CO2 duration the same in the studies comparing TCD and bold CVR? Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, so we were set that up exactly to try and make sure that the four the four minutes was the same i guess we and again so we took we took a, a steady state um, analysis time point um, around a three minute mark and, and, and averaged that um, and depending on which um, i guess analysis approach with the mri um, you used uh, then you, i guess it, it can be different, but what we also did, which we haven't presented, is that we we used, I guess, the vice versa, the, the different analysis processes that we use. So we, the same thing for the general linear model with that you use for, for the bold, where you look across that whole response. We did the same thing with with the Doppler traces as well, um, and we also did, I guess, that steady state point at you know sixty or thirty seconds at three minutes, and we did that with the bold, and it didn't change any, any of the outcomes. So um, if if that if that answers your question. So yeah, we gave the same same time stimulus, but in, in, a, in a way, I guess the typical approaches that we use to analyze bold data or TCD data also differ. Um, so we were trying to use, I guess, complementary or the, the common approaches specific to each modality, but we also cross-checked that across the modalities as, as well. Did that kind of answer the question? And Karen can probably better answer that than me. <laughs> I think so. Thank you very much, she said. <laughs> um, next question from Timo Klein. Very interesting and nice talk, Dr. Lucas. Could you comment on the vessel diameter between young and old in uh, your TCD MRI study? Uh, the, Karen, do you, can you remember, we, we obviously didn't measure diameter with our TCD approach. Um, we did measure, did we measure diameter with, we didn't, okay. Well, I guess what's interesting, um, a recent study from Jill Barnes's group, uh, I think it's the Miller study that used the 4D PCA flow, um, PCA, the 4D PC, P, uh, PCA um, a sequence showed that um, the older group didn't change their diameter where you did see a change in diameter with the CVR response in the younger cohort. And that might then be linked to, I guess, age-related changes in arterial stiffness. Um, so yeah, we didn't measure diameter, but there's this um, there's some neat work, uh, recent work out there that has shown that there are age-related differences in diameter changes in response to the CVR the CVR stimulus, which might explain some of the differences that, that that you're certainly seeing when you're looking at velocity versus flow with Doppler or flux if you're using PCA with um, with, with an MRI. So, um, yeah, <laughs> answer the question. Yeah, there are diameter changes and they could be different between uh, cohorts that you're measuring depending on age or even disease status. Um, and then these are things that I guess we need to think about as well. I would add to that that we kind of we didn't measure diameter directly um but obviously by looking at both the velocity and the flow from the PCA data we kind of have an indication that diameter is changing in a different way between our older and our younger group but we didn't really have the resolution to be confidently able to measure diameter directly. Great. Um, next question from Nick Bray. Great talk, Dr. Lucas. Other than popularity, was there a rationale for using bold instead of ESL? Um, yeah, again, I guess Karen's probably answered some, some of that. But yeah, I guess the bold is really, um, we use that because it tends to be the most common approach. And I guess that Thomas paper um, particularly, I guess, stimulated a lot of, um, a lot of, 
the rationale or the reasoning that we did it. Um, but to try and understand our outcomes, that's why we then introduced, or we, you know, we were using ASL and the PCA approach to try and help um, with a more direct measure of blood flow, I guess, as, as Karen and I, um, described, to try and understand why the bowl was different to the TCA. Yeah. So in study one that we performed, we actually simultaneously were measuring BOLD and ASL. Um, but when we looked at the ASL data, I didn't have the confidence that we had the signal to noise to interpret the data. So we, um, we stopped analyzing that aspect of our data. Um, I think we needed to do some more optimization, um, especially around this um, business of when you do the imaging versus when you're tagging the blood in the neck, um, because I just didn't have the confidence that our data was sufficient signal to noise, which is a problem that is a general problem of ASL data um, for CVR measures. It is much, much noisier. Um, and many, I, I've talked to many people who've had similar, similar problems um, trying to use ASL for CVR measures. Great. Um, next question uh, from Michelle Lazarenza. Um, there, uh, Sam Lucas, thank you for your interesting talk. My question, have you considered using non-invasive optical techniques such as the time domain near infrared spectroscopy or diffuse correlation spectroscopy to measure such cerebral hemodynamic variations? Do you see any drawbacks or advantages? Um, yeah, so NIRS is, is another great option. Um, I guess, um, it's, I guess, and again, Karen, I'm trying to divert all the questions, but I'm getting hammered here. It's terrible. Um, but essentially, you're measuring a very similar thing um, as you are with bold. So it has all those same, I guess, issues in terms of um, under, underlying that. In terms of, a, I guess, the time domain nears, um, that certainly gets over some of the limitations in terms of, I guess, the confounding extra cranial um, of that measure. So you may... It means that you're, what you're measuring from a from an oxy deoxy ratio is is maybe more reliable, but that's just getting to the start of the issues that I guess Karen um, raised with that. Um, so yeah, but having having said that, there's a there's a recent study that's just come out looking at TBI um, CVR responses comparing bold versus. Um, NIRS, and I think it was a continuous wave NIRS system, uh, so an off-the-shelf, the cheaper version of that, and they showed similar things in terms of its, I guess, disease or predictability. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, we have considered it, and I don't think we've really looked at at that, um, well, I haven't got, we've got so a recent study with Katarina Rendera, who's going to present, I think, in a later seminar, she'll show some NIRS data using CVR uh, before and after a flavanol intervention. So um, stay tuned for that. I'm not going to steal um, Katarina's thunder, but I think there's some really cool, um, and it, <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's some interesting, there's some interesting response. Um, but we'll um, probably just find another way of not correlating CVR. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Another question from uh, Dr. Bodin for Karen. Do you have any thoughts on quantifying CVR during resting state fMRI sequences? Well, <laughs> I'm going to refer this question to Sam and Ryan because so this is this is something that is done, and I like obviously um, I'm sure Andrew and others are aware that there's lots of literature coming out showing that we can get similar CVR maps. Um, using resting state data, so where there's no gas challenge at all and you're just monitoring the natural um, changes in end tidal CO2. Um, from bold data, you can get similar maps to doing a gas challenge, but um, the, the reason I'm going to refer it back to people who know more about physiology than me is whether that's really tapping into the same vascular responsiveness I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a very similar argument to spontaneous versus forced oscillations with the autoregulation, um, I guess, story as well. So, yeah, resting state versus a functional dynamic response. Um, yeah, I don't know. Ryan, have you got um, thoughts on, on that? No, unfortunately, I'm not um, too familiar with that. I mean, 
<clears throat> I think we gain a bit of benefit from the fact that the, the response is typically linear. So if you are getting, you know, a several millimeter mercury range in, in end tidal gases at rest, if, if breathing is relatively variable, then maybe you're getting a, enough of a, a, a change in blood flow, but um, I have, don't have any, you know, data or, or, or experience to, to comment on. I think there's a, there's a paper in the, the special special topic, I think, that Molly, that, that Molly Bright um, is one of the co-authors on, so it might be worth, I guess, having a read of that, or you, you might be, that might be your paper. <laughs> <laughs> right. A uh, question from Veronica Guada, uh, Guadagni, sorry. To all panelists, is it correct to consider changes in cerebral blood flow due to changes in ventilation and therefore PET CO2 during exercise, a measure of reactivity? Yeah, do you mind? Um, so that's a that's a great question. Um, I think the the regulation of the changes in blood flow during exercise <clears throat> is fairly complex, and there's there's a lot going on. Um, we do know from a, a lot of different studies that the the pattern of blood flow change during exercise follows the changes in end tidal carbon dioxide we see. Um, but there's also some work demonstrating that if you maintain isocapnia throughout exercise, you'll still get a very similar blood flow response. And so the direct causal relationship with CO2 isn't you know, necessarily as, as strong as we might think. So whether or not it can be taken as CO2 reactivity, um, I wouldn't be so sure. But whether or not it's a, a measure of reactivity to a, a different stimulus or a, a multifaceted stimulus, um, I mean, potentially, yeah. But relative to, to CO2 specifically, I'm not totally sure on, on what the utility of that would be. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated business, I mm. guess. The, the the control or regulation of breathing during exercise um, is, a, is another whole seminar series, I guess. <laughs> um, um, yeah, in, in terms of and some of the some of the stuff that we presented last time, looking at the relationship between exercise induced changes in brain blood flow and how that was being mediated or controlled by by CO two, and that can depend on which exercise intense or which exercise modality you're doing and the intensity that you're that you're that you're at so uh, again it is there's you know yeah so there's i agree with i agree with ryan it's 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 hard to know um you know whether you could use that i guess directly as a as a, as a co2 reactivity measure just because it's i would argue maybe even more complicated than this <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, next question from our co-host, Karen Rickards. That, that was a, such an informative presentation, Karen. You presented quite a few studies comparing CVR across different methods where the p-values were low, but the r-values were only moderate. What are your thoughts about the threshold we should be using to make claims that the CVR responses are similar between methods? <laughs> Well, there's a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, this, this almost becomes a statistics question then, which isn't, I think, and Sam and I both are of the same opinion that you kind of have to present all your data and all of your data points and let people draw their own conclusions. Um, whether it's p-value uh, is significant or not significant, that's why like, we talk about different patterns rather than necessarily um, significance. Um, I think it's it, it's very difficult, and this is where, especially for MRI, getting big cohorts of people through an MRI study is and not a trivial task because it's so expensive to do an MRI um, session. And so, doing these like we need big CVR studies, but there aren't that very, very many of them um, to really get to the bottom of this. And big CVR studies where you're ideally doing bold and ASL and PCA and then you can really start to get a full picture of what's going on um it, it there's yeah it it's difficult I mean there's lots of studies um out there with only kind of between 10 and 20 subjects which is not uncommon um in MRI for um lots of different aspects of looking at brain function um and and so 
then you get a significant result, which then gets shown not to be significant in another study or shows the opposite pattern. And so, yeah, I guess that's the also where systematic reviews bringing all of this stuff together are going to be important um, as we go forward. Not sure if that answers the question, but that's my that's my thoughts on the matter. <laughs> Any other burning questions? Hmm. I guess yeah, just to add on to onto what Karen just said. You know, I guess then we also need to decide, you know, what stimulus response tasks we're going to use you know one minute on cycles of one minute off and on the three minutes should we be using a clamp target system should we be doing open circuit um, rebreathing and all these all these questions um uh you know uh, uh, i guess up for grabs great another question uh, joanna pinto great talks everyone regarding resting state cvr sam maybe you are referring with my uh, my paper with molly bright yes I am. Okay. <laughs> and there and this, there are some papers on this showing correlation with CO2 CVR. Nevertheless, a limitation of this approach is that if the subject's spontaneous breathing pattern yields minimal fluctuations in their pet CO2 level, there might not be enough signal variation for reliable CVR assessment. Um, additionally, isolating low frequency build fluctuations arising uh, from CVR mechanisms versus other physiologic noise sources or neural processes might be difficult to achieve. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's a very similar argument to spontaneous versus forced oscillations to look at the, the blood pressure perfusion, um, you know, a relationship as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. Yep. I was I was typing the question. I, I you know <laughs> I, I Sam's um, you know presentation and, and Karen's uh, talk and then all of the. Um, data presented by Ryan. Is there any any uh, interest by Carnet or people on this group to write a like a white paper or a recommendations paper for methodology, so that we do a you know maybe more in line for comparison, so that we're not all doing different things. Um, you know, I know one came out like for flow mediated, mediated dilation by Jame Padilla. Um, you know, in 2011 for flow mediated dilation. I just didn't know if there was anything like that in the works, or if I've missed one somewhere that's published, um, and maybe I have, and that's why everybody's quiet, maybe I've missed that paper. No, no, no. <laughs> it's brilliant, um, absolutely. <laughs> I guess I, we're gonna decide which, <laughs> what we're gonna say in that, what are we gonna recommend? I, I, think, I, I, I think, yeah. I, um, yeah I mean, right. It seems like some of your work comparing Sam shows, I mean, even just maybe making I don't know, recommendations. I, I think as I've been a part of like the uh, P30 Alzheimer's disease centers and trying to harmonize uh, protocols and, and share, which Karen can probably appreciate because the MRI machines are different, sequences are different. Um, but when you harmonize that, it's easy to share data or you know do things across sites. And so if you can compile data sets, sometimes that's nice. I just a thought I'd, I'd throw out there. Um, sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry, go Karen. Um, I can see Nick Blockley is still on the line. Maybe he wants to say something. But um, in the MRI world, Nick Blockley and um, Molly Bright arranged a CVR, small CVR conference um, just for MRI a few years ago now. Um, and the idea was a similar sort of thing to try and create some sort of white paper. And there was no consensus. <laughs> Yeah. So Nick, I don't know whether you want to say any more. I think it would be a great idea if, and I think from my point of view, if we could get a, a agreement of how to do even just the gas challenge side of things um, that was agreed for however you're doing that your measurement, like whether you're using Doppler or MR or whatever, that would be the first step. Um, I'm not sure we necessarily can have a consensus on how to do the MRI because as I've kind of shown, the different MRI measures are giving you different information. So maybe we still want all of those, but yeah, that's my thoughts on the matter. Yeah, if I can just chime in, um, it's definitely something we talked about when we were um, originally speaking about this specific like seminar talk. 
and and I, I agree with Karen's comment. It might not be that we reach a consensus per se, but that we have we we could develop outlines for each technique with the you know each individual factor that we should be mindful of relative to what they're telling us, how that impacts the data interpretation, and how that may or may not um, facilitate or hinder a comparison between um, different measurements. So it's it's definitely something that we. Um, we want to work towards and and this makes sense as a good uh, starting point i think yeah i i, I, I totally agree and i think um part of part of my naivety really uh, at the beginning of all of this was like oh we'll just do this in mri and and, uh, and it wasn't until that point and then when I, I guess built that table for this talk that i kind of revisit all of this and thought man this is a mess there's so <laughs> much there's so many different techniques here what are we doing <laughs> um it's all I, I think some of it um, you know, and, and I pretty much put this measure in most of the studies that I do, um, and, and I was completely oblivious to how how differently it's done across different studies. So I think I think the first point, um, and, and I guess one of the what the aims that I wanted to hopefully bring across was that there's there's just so much inconsistency, and, and I think just highlighting the problem is is a really important step. Um, so yeah, maybe that's what we do is just say, look, you know, these are the different options, you know maybe we should be thinking about working towards something that makes it better. Oh, and we are approaching the two hour mark. Um, maybe one last question from Mark Chertoff. For the gas challenge studies, I noticed that the onset time and offset the times differ. Is this due to physiology or the stimulus control? Yeah, I think the question's for me. Um, for like the, the, <laughs> the onset times, if you're just referring to the amount of time before individuals are switched onto the CO2 breathing with either the FiCO2 or end tidal forcing um, protocols, um, the, those data sets are from different studies, and so it'll just be differences in the the like the baseline um, periods for those studies. And same with the actual duration of the CO2 stimulus. Um, I was just taking examples from different work, so they weren't different specifically. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, with NTEL forcing or FICO2, you could presumably continue them for as, as, as long as you want it. Great, so I would like to, I'm sure Carolyn will join me to uh, thank you, uh, Ryan, Sam, and, and Karen, when we, we initially talk about that uh, specific seminar, this is exactly what, what we had in mind. So no consensus, but a lot of <laughs> questions, a lot of issues to think, uh, to think about. But then I would like to thank you. It was like an amazing seminar. And thank you for the audience who are still around. So I will just share my screen for the next one. Ryan will still be with us following a short break for of a few weeks. Uh, in the beginning of May, we'll have a, um, a seminar around the topic of cerebral blood flow and oxygen de delivery in post-cardiac arrest hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Should be, again, very uh, fascinating. So again, thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, see you in the beginning of May. <laughs>